So, hello everyone. Thank you uh, for coming uh, to our first um, online meetup. Um, really grateful to have you here. Uh, my name is Arash Kapamanesh and um, I will introduce our program and the initiative. Very short, what we are about. Um, and um, yeah, originally, uh, Swarna Puriya wanted to welcome you, but she's in on vacation in India, and I have to to welcome you. Um, and we would have a session with Ihor about the new features in Kubernetes 1.7, and with Rob Hirschfeld about the pain points of Kubernetes and how to upgrade. And at the end, this will uh, this really will uh, present our free training program. So, who we are and how we started, um, I initiated the uh, Kubernetes I.O. Um, last year um, during the Christmas and then Swarna and Mark Jackson joined uh, and asked if they could work, uh, help as volunteers to um, start with the initiative, um, I would like to uh, thank Swarna and especially Marky. Marky was one of the first, uh, or he was the first guy who contacted me and wanted to help with that. Um, unfortunately, uh, due to a medical emergency, he couldn't attend uh, to this session. Uh, we wanted him to present um, our first um, training by this meetup. Um, Stefan and Des are um, supporting me together with other guys um, from India. Um, Taras is in Dallas from Rationalize uh, IT um, and is going to provide trainings for us and also Arush. I think he's one of the attendees. Um, I would love to thank you very much for your support um, and also everyone is to welcome to the leadership team. Um, we are, have a Slack channel and uh, I would love to invite you to uh, attend and uh, be part of the journey. Um, yes, we are about learning and providing trainings, free trainings uh, and um, provide the whole thing. Uh, Des will uh, uh, show you later uh, where our training materials uh, exist today. Um, we have git books for you and we would like to help you everyone to become a certified Kubernetes administrator and later um, after being a uh, administrated a certified Kubernetes administrators program by a uh, program by Cloud Native Foundation, and then we will would like to help you to become a Kubernetes professional. So, um, what we are going to address uh, is to solve real world problems by uh, real world projects which we have and uh, work together with you um, on various projects which we have. Um, you're welcome to join us. Um, and currently we are in the transition phase to become a non-profit organization. Currently we are only an initiative. And the um, organization will be registered in Germany as a Eingetragene <laughs> Verein. And that's a non-profit organization. Um, very soon, I think, I hope by, by the end of August. Um, and we'd love to, what we, we love open source technology, we love the community around, we love Linux Foundation, uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. We love to learn from you, uh, work with you and the lovely community and uh, as I mentioned, we love to become a um, 
official, an official CNCF member very soon, as soon we are an organization. So a, an initiative can't become an, uh, a member currently for CNCF, but we are in the phase to apply for that and uh, we'll be very happy to uh, provide um, free education for everyone um, and also earn a little bit money for our initiative and provide on-site trainings for uh, together with our partners for everybody. Um, so and also we love our partners and supporters especially Rec N with Rob, uh, Mirantis, uh, Ihor, as uh, for his great support, um, Katakoda with Ben Hall, um, New Rector with uh, Michael uh, B42 Solution uh, with Peter Rosbach, Rationalized IT uh, with Faraz and Rancher Labs. With, uh, with Sebastian from Netherlands um, and my own company Cloud Sky. So um, and we'd love to love you too. <laughs> Small players on the market uh, from Amazon to SAP. Um, we are going to get in touch with them and uh, ask for help um, uh, to 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 support us by uh, providing pre trainings. Um, so one point at the end, um, we are not only about Kubernetes, right? So we love OpenStack, uh, the cloud native technology or thinking uh, at all, and um, also Cloud Foundry, Apache Mesos, and also Mobi, you know about it. <laughs> um, so about our certification plan, this is the initial plan uh, This will introduce the uh, current plan which we have in more detail later but our plan is to help you to get fundamental trainings uh, through uh, our visual classes uh, and then help you to bring you in real world projects and um, show you how you can work in practice with Kubernetes and solve real world projects. Uh, problems uh, <clears throat> by our real world projects, right? So, and help you to, to become a certified Kubernetes administrator and later a master to projects by your companies or by other companies. Um, so, if you want, would like to get in touch with us, you can join us on Slack. Um, on, on, on Kubernetes uh, Slack channel as well by Kubernetes teachers. Um, we have an, a GitHub account or our GitHub um, and on Twitter, uh, the meetup, you know about it, and also on Kubernetes IO. Um, so, and uh, yes, if you would like to join us, we have some free <laughs> job openings on our site. Um, we would like, we are hiring. Um, would love to, to hear from you. And yes, thank you. That was um, my short introduction to Kubernetes AO, what we were about. And um, we'd love to work with you and learn from you. That's more important, the most important point. So I'd love have to, I hope it works, and to give the control to Iho. Okay, you are, you should have the control now. Does it work for you? Oh, does it work now? Yeah, I hear you. And can you see my screen now? Yes, I can see your screen with the slides, right? Ah, fine, great. Okay. So, hello everyone. My name is Ihor Dvoretsky. I'm a program manager at Mirantis. I'm also responsible for the community commons at Kubernetes community and around, especially at Cloud Native Foundation and 
CNCF related activities. And my primary role in Kubernetes community, I'm serving as a co-lead for product management SIG group, special interest group. It is mostly focused on uh, working on Kubernetes and moving Kubernetes forward from the product perspective. We are mostly focused on the features on the product roadmap and the related items that make they may make successful Kubernetes as a solid product, as a solid market product, and as a solid open source product. Uh, also, I'm happy to serve as uh, one of the members of the release team for Kubernetes 1.7 as a person responsible for the features. And today I will highlight the most notable features that we have in Kubernetes 1.7 that has been just landed a few weeks ago. So speaking about the Kubernetes release timeline, how often do we release Kubernetes? We usually have four releases per year. And Kubernetes 1.7 is the second release in 2017. It has been released in the, at the end of second quarter, right, a few days before the July 4th, the big big holiday in the United States and I suppose that it was the great the great chance for many people to celebrate not only that holiday but also Kubernetes 1.7 release date. We are also expecting to have two more releases in this uh, in 2017 until the end of the year and I hope they will be also really notable for, in terms of features and the enhancements that you as the end, end users can notice there. I'd like to compare, uh, to like run a brief comparison between the stats in Kubernetes 1.6 and 1.7. So Kubernetes 1.6 was the previous release. It has, uh, it has been released at the end of quarter one in the end of March. And actually it has been presented first time at the stage at, in Berlin at KubeCon. And Kubernetes 1.6 was a notable release because it was probably one of the first releases of Kubernetes that has to that has been marked, unofficially marked, as a more stabilization release. And for this year, and we're expecting to follow the tradition for the next next years and the next iterations, we're going to follow the TikTok model at Kubernetes community where we'll have one release that will be more focused on the new features or the new functionality and the new experience for the users. And the second release will be focused more on stability and stabilization of that features that have been delivered before. And looking at these stats, you may notice that we have almost the same number of features in both releases. So we had almost 30 features in 1.6 and in 1.7, but the proportion between alpha, beta and stable features is totally different. Uh, just a brief remark about what does it mean alpha, beta or stable. So alpha feature is uh, like the experimental feature of what of what the developers in Kubernetes community can show to the world. So it can be described as a feature that is ready for production usage. You should also consider that uh, the big part of almost all functionality can change. Even uh, some features when they have been promoted from alpha to beta stage, even their name has been changed like we had with pet sets and stateful sets. So alpha feature is mostly the working concept of what can be delivered in Kubernetes and what can be achieved with Kubernetes. And we're expecting these features to be more stabilized in the next releases after the initial date, after the initial release as an alpha. Beta feature can be compared to alpha feature with the most stable API. So we have declared that if uh, the feature owner promotes his feature to beta, the API is stable and constant. So no changes are allowed there. Beta feature is also almost completely constant in the terms of the, of the functionality. So comparing to alpha feature where uh, the big part of almost all functionality can be changed during the development process. If you're using beta feature, you shouldn't expect any notable and big changes in functionality later. And stable features are, uh, can be really considered as production ready usage, uh, for production ready usage. So if you're using stable feature, you can be ensured that it's rock solid. It has been tested multiple times. It 
has been developed during, during multiple iterations within the Kubernetes release cycle. So if you're using stable features, you can be ensured that it will work for production usage, I mean. And coming back to the features that we had in 1.6 and 1.7 and comparing the stats with them and the proportions, so you may notice that most of the features that have been delivered in Kubernetes 1.6 in the previous release that, as I told, it has been marked as stabilization release. So most of these features are labeled as beta stable. So most of these features have been enhancement to the previous features that have been de delivered during 2016, during the previous year. But in 1.7, most of the features are alpha features. So exactly in this release, you may try and uh, try to use some new functionality that is delivered right now. So, and we're expecting that in the next releases in 1.8, 1.9, until the end of the year, we will have these features that I will present for you today. They will be more rock solid and we will be ready for the production usage as beta and stable features. The major team for the release are mostly, um, Mostly moving Kubernetes towards the enterprise readiness and enable um, enable some multiple features that allow you to look at Kubernetes at a different angle comparing to the to the previous Kubernetes iterations. The most notable teams for this release are security, uh, stateful workloads enhancements, also extensibility. We also have uh, several notable enhancements to federation behavior and cloud providers. Speaking about security, so security is probably one of the most important areas for the enterprise readiness and uh, one of the most important areas for our enterprise users, for Kubernetes enterprise users. But it doesn't mean that regular users don't, don't need security at all as well. So speaking about the security features, the most notable there are encrypting secrets in ADCD, so this feature has been delivered as an alpha and it brings absolutely new functionality to the existing behavior of ATCD. So before Kubernetes 1.7, secrets in ATCD haven't been encrypted. And it hasn't been the big problem for the users of Kubernetes that have been using some managed solutions like GKE, for example, Google Container Engine. But if you're using open source version of Kubernetes and premises or like in, in, a, in a different version, you may consider that uh, having your secrets unencrypted un un may significantly affect your security, security status of your Kubernetes cluster. So since this release, we have enabled encryption at a database layer. So since this release, secrets in ATCD are encrypted. Uh, this feature defends you from the unexpected access to ETCD APIs. So nobody, uh, no, nobody who is not authorized to do that can't receive an access to your secrets that are stored currently in ETCD. Also, this feature can support multiple encryption providers and key rotation. That's also really important for for several use cases when you are uh, really thinking about enhancing your security up to the top layer. Another notable feature in terms of security, but it's not really the only security feature, but it is, it's also the networking feature, is networking policy. It's not a brand new feature compared to encrypting secrets in HTTPCD. It's a stable feature today, and it has been promoted from beta and alpha, alpha stages from the previous releases. But today in Kubernetes 1.7, we represent networking policy uh, in general availability. And it's one of the most notable features for you if you are interested in multi-tenancy. And it's probably one of the uh, multiple milestones in Kubernetes move forward to multi-tenants enablement. So with networking policy, you may define um, how how does multiple networking policy objects may interact with uh, with multiple Kubernetes resources? So uh, before you, uh, your networking policy hasn't been strictly uh, strictly defined, and you've been able to 
and like an end user and uh, in the networking flow has been able to access all the resources in your Kubernetes cluster. With the networking policy, you can inform some of the, some of the rules and with this feature, you can be really ensured that your Kubernetes, Kubernetes cluster from the networking side will be totally secured. And this feature is also uh, enabled not only from the Kubernetes core side, but the final implementation is put to the uh, to the networking solution, to the networking provider, since you know Kubernetes supports at the moment so a big variety of multiple networking providers, and we expect and uh, uh, the branders and the producers of the third-party networking providers to enable that feature on their side. And in this case, you will, your cluster will be totally secured. The next uh, layer of Kubernetes notable features for this release is enabling for stateful workload support. So as most of you know, and you may expect that Kubernetes and Docker and the general container ecosystem at all has been initially designed with stateless applications in mind. And uh, in the early years, the most common use case for using Kubernetes and the similar solutions for container orchestration uh, was the use case when you, for example, you have your uh, web server installation with the front end that is being run uh, uh, on, on Kubernetes on the related solution, on the related container solution, and it is stateless. At the same time, your stateful part, your stateful backend with databases and interrelated uh, interrelated items uh, should be deployed on the virtual machines or rare metal machines or somewhere where uh, stateful stateful workload support is enabled by design. With this release, we are enhancing behavior of your stateful workloads, and we are expecting that more and more users will start using Kubernetes as a single solution for all types of their workloads, including stateful and stateless workloads. So, probably one of the most notable features in Kubernetes 107 that is related to uh, that is related to stateful workload support enablement is local storage management. Uh, as probably you know, before you've been using Kubernetes local storage as an ephemeral storage. So when your local when your local machine dies, when your local pods dies, your local storage will also will also die. So if you're going to use some uh, some state, uh, if you would like to save your state on some solid storage somewhere, you have to use the, for example, like networking solutions like. Um, NFS or iSCSI or like some proprietary or semi-proprietary service solutions that are network, not touched by network. With this release, you're also able to store your um, store your local state on the local machine. It, uh, it is really a notable feature because it significantly changes your behavior as a Kubernetes operator in a way of consuming Kubernetes resources and working with Kubernetes. So now you are able to run almost every type of workloads on your Kubernetes cluster. Also, this feature allows you to, uh, to make running of your Kubernetes cluster cheaper because usually local storage is much cheaper is much, and much uh, less expensive than the network attached storage. So, it's it's really great great feature also in terms of performance and availability because it's much easier for you to access from your local node your local storage that is located exactly on the same node. It's much better for you in terms of performance to access that storage. So that's again it's one of the most notable features in Kubernetes 1.7 release and I really recommend you to try working with it. It's still in alpha, it's still in active development, but I would recommend you to test it. And we're expecting this feature to be released in beta and L and in beta and stable stages during the next few releases. So probably until the, at the end of the year, you'll be able to use uh, your local storage on your Kubernetes clusters in production. Speaking about the second feature that, uh, that can be considered as the one big global feature. It's more um, feature enhancement to the existing feature. It's stateful set updates. 
stateful sets, or like previously they've been called pet sets, they have been delivered in the previous year and they have been promoted to beta status at the end of 2016. At the same time, in Kubernetes 1.6, uh, stateful sets updates have been enabled about that feature, and in 1.7 we have this feature promoted to, to beta, so previously it was an alpha feature. So with stateful set updates, you are able to manage your uh, local databases, for example, that are, mostly, that are mostly used by stateful state updates by their end users. So with this feature, you are able to continuously update, and we are also expecting in the next few releases to deliver rollback and rolling update feature as well. The different area that has been significantly enhanced since the end of, since the second part of 2016, and it probably one of the most uh, actively developed era in Kubernetes uh, runtimes. Uh, and the, the most notable era and most notable feature in runtimes, runtimes era is CRI. It's a container runtime interface that allows you to plug in any compatible type of runtime interface to your Kubernetes cluster. People who have been working with Kubernetes since the early days could notice that at the beginning Kubernetes was being strictly bundled to Docker and Docker was the only type of runtime that you've been able to use with Kubernetes. Uh, thanks for developers of multiple different runtimes that have been de delivered the compatibility of their runtimes with Kubernetes, uh, and the group that is responsible for runtimes enablement in Kubernetes community. Now we have container runtime interface that allows you to enable any of these compatible runtimes for your Kubernetes cluster. That contains runtimes like not only Docker but also Rocket, like Hyper. Uh, CRIO and multiple other runtimes that allow you, for example, even run virtual meshes on your Kubernetes, on your Kubernetes clusters, not only containers. And everything we add is runtime interface. And one of the most notable features here that has been mostly developed by uh, as the third party component is container D enablement. People who've been following the news from Cloud Native Computing Foundation could notice that Container D, since the end of March, is also one of the projects of CNCF. This project has been donated by Docker, and Container D is one of the core components of Docker as a runtime, while Container D is a runtime itself, while Docker is more solid and is more is more solid product that also incorporates several other features and uh, and multiple like bigger functionality comparing to Container D itself. So again, Container D is a pure runtime, and for Kubernetes, it is really notable enhancement because multiple users, multiple developers have noticed for, for a long period of time that Docker, as the solid product, is not only a runtime but Docker as Docker. Uh, has some overlap between the existing features in Kubernetes and it will overhead your resources. Using ContainerD as a runtime is the pure cloud native way where you simply use exactly that component that will solve your needs without any overlap with the existing components. So ContainerD is a pure runtime for Kubernetes while Docker has been not only runtime but also delivered some other features that, that are not necessary in our current setups. And also with Container D, we may expect uh, better, uh, better performance because again, we don't have so huge overlap of the resources and we don't have so huge overlap in functionality. This feature has been delivered as an alpha feature for this release and we're also expecting that this feature will be uh, will be more solid for the for the next few releases, and we're expecting also the users of cloud native products and projects to consume it. Speaking about other notable features, one of the most notable items in this release is um, federation related item, federation related feature. It is policy based federation resource placement. 
It's also the brand new feature that has been delivered as an alpha for this release. And this feature enables uh, placement policies for the federated clusters. That means that if you have your federated Kubernetes cluster and different parts of your cluster that are distributed can be affected by multiple uh, multiple uh, external reasons uh, like multiple uh, ways of consuming these resources, including like company conventions, like some external regulations, like government regulations and so on. Uh, probably you're using uh, your, uh, uh, your Kubernetes clusters in a federated hybridized environment when you're using some part of your uh, federated Kubernetes cluster on-premise, different part is being used on public cloud that usually is, uh, is not cheaper than your on-premises premises installation and so on. So you may have uh, multiple use cases for using your Kubernetes federated cluster. And with this, with this feature, when you may define the policies how your federated resources should be deployed on top of Kubernetes cluster, you may define what, where, and how can be deployed. This feature is implemented with Open Policy Agent. It's an open source. It's also the one of uh, the most noticeable, noticeable parts of this feature is an open source uh, policy engine that uh, includes a declarative policy language and APIs to answer policy queries. Again, this feature has been delivered as an alpha for Kubernetes 1.7. And we expect them to have it in beta and stable soon. Yet another big feature, and I can't say it, it's uh, it's a real feature. It's more like an umbrella on top of the multiple features that have been under active development for the last few iterations. Is the cloud provider support? So uh, with Kubernetes 1.7, we are enabling. Uh, support of out of tree and out of process cloud providers uh, as, as the alpha. Uh, what does it mean? So it means that we are moving forward within the Kubernetes community to, uh, to simplify Kubernetes core and to move all the uh, not mandatory components for everyday usage and for every kind of installation of Kubernetes to the uh, to the separate components and this uh, and enabling cloud providers as the separate component is the huge move, huge move, move forward following that uh, decline. So uh, we have at Kubernetes community we have noticed several issues and questions trying to uh, trying to maintain the huge code base that has been consistent of multiple parts that are not necessary for every Kubernetes installation. So if you're using your uh, Kubernetes cluster on a really in a sim really simplified mode, like some local host installation or similar, you don't need to enable your cloud provider's support. So this feature, this, uh, this, this part of Kubernetes core can be moved to the to, to some uh, to some of the pluggable errors, actually that uh, that's also related to CRI, for example, or the similar interfaces like CNI container container uh, networking interface, a uh, container storage interface, CSI, and so on. So speaking ag again about cloud provider support, this part have been moved to uh, out of Kubernetes core, and now it's much easier for us as, as developers, and now it's much easier for you as Kubernetes operators to consume a pure Kubernetes core without the unnecessary parts of it if you don't need them. At the same time, it's much easier for you to maintain uh, these, these items and these, uh, these parts of Kubernetes if you really require them. Also, moving cloud providers, cloud providers out of tree uh, allows cloud vendors to enable uh, enable their, uh, for example, public cloud vendors, private cloud vendors to enable their cloud support support for Kubernetes. So they don't need to incorporate their changes into Kubernetes core, but they simply can develop the solution that will be compatible with with Kubernetes core and provide it as as, as a separate cloud provider, and it 
will also much simplify the life of the consumers of the public and private clouds. The other notable change, it's not really a new feature, but it's a big change in existing Kubernetes behavior, is about third-party resources that have been replaced with, at this release with custom resource definitions. So uh, when developers of this feature have been working on it, um, they have decided to simplify a lot uh, the API and provide the multiple fixes and enhancements. And the number was so, so big and notable, so it has been decided to provide the, the, the new type of concept for Kubernetes that are container resource definitions. So party resources are still available in Kubernetes 1.7, but they are marked as deprecated. And we are expecting to completely remove this, uh, this feature from the next releases. So if you're using support resources today, and you're going to use it uh, for in the future, please consider switching and consider migrating to CRD. You will have enough time to do that because in Kubernetes 1.7 they're both enabled. And since the later releases, support resources will be deprecated in, in favor of customer source, customer source definitions. Uh, most notable features for Kubernetes 1.7, and if you're interested in the whole list of the features that have been delivered during the last three months of active development and fixing, you may check our, our list announcement at blogkubernetes.io uh, with the detailed description, detailed and brief description of every feature that has been delivered with, at this release. And also you may check the release notes that incorporate almost every change that has been pushed into Kubernetes 1.7 during the last three months of development. If you have any questions, you can reach me and other members of SIG product management via this link. We have the Slack channel, we have mailing list, and we are always welcome to, to you to answer your questions. And also feel free to reach me directly. That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, is there any questions? I don't see anything in the chat. Or ah, okay. I, on Slack, we on Slack it was a question. Uh, isn't Creo more performant than Containerd? Well, it's more the question to, um, to the developers of these interfaces. The biggest benefit for us as Kubernetes developers, Kubernetes consumers, and Kubernetes community that you are allowed to choose any of them and run exactly on your environment and to try to use exactly for you use cases and define which one will be better for you. So both of both can be used with Kubernetes. So please try to use any of them. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions, guys, ladies? Okay, if not, then uh, I would like to Um, switch to Rob. Give Rob the control. Rob, please. It looks like you should be able to see my screen now. Ah, uh, yes. Excellent. All right, which is mostly you right now, so let me move to my web browser so you can see <laughs> what I'm presenting. Um, so hello, my name is Rob Hirschfeld. Hey. Um, I am the co-chair of the Cluster Ops. You ready for me to start? I was just going to dive in. Ash, is that all right? Yeah, 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 yeah. please. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm eager. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I've, got, I've got a ton of great content and some live demos uh, for everybody. My name is Rob Hirschfeld. I'm CEO and co-founder of a company called RackN, uh, and I've been involved in the Kubernetes community for a long time. I'm co-chair of the Cluster Ops SIG, so we work on helping operators be more productive 
um, talk to each other, sort of build a community. We're trying to make sure that operators have a voice. And if you're, we, we meet uh, every other Thursday, uh, uh, and you can come to, you can find us on, online in a whole bunch of places. But if you have questions, just ping me about that. Uh, some of this work uh, that I'm showing you comes out of that. A lot of it comes out of the work that RACN is very invested in doing. Uh, we work on infrastructure automation, what we call underlay automation, uh, using an open source project called Digital Rebar. Uh, Digital Rebar is what I'm going to run for the demos, but a lot of what I'm going to show you is actually based on Kube Spray, the upstream Ansible pieces, and just general ops work. Um, and it's from a presentation that I gave uh, so this is the infrastructure that I'll demo in a couple minutes, and it's from a presentation that uh, my CTO and I gave at Glucon uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, and you can, the slides are up and you're, you're welcome to see them. I'm going to switch into presentation mode. I promise I'll, I'll jump to the demo pretty soon, but it, it's really helpful to stage this up a little bit uh, because the idea here is that, you know, you can do a quick start can get things running, but it's not really going to be that helpful if you want to operate a system. So we want to talk about day two quite a bit. Um, this is some background. You might know me as Vehicle Online. Uh, it's my Twitter handle and my GitHub handle and my everything handle. Uh, and what we really want to do is not just show you that you can upgrade Kubernetes, but we really believe that upgrading is part of a shared operations practice. It's not just some people can upgrade. It needs to be part of how the community works together to maintain an operational environment that can be upgraded, right? We just talked about 1.7 um, release features. <laughs> Kubernetes has a quarterly release cycle. That's incredibly fast. Um, and we don't want people to not take 1.7 or more importantly, not take 1.6 because 1.7 is out. So if you want to start right away, you could start with 1.6. There's no reason to wait if we can get people through an upgrade process. We're going to show, you, show how that goes. That said, in 1.7, I am very excited to see some operational simplifications that help uh, nodes get certificates and keep their certificates updated and get classified and accepted into a cluster um, that I think will simplify the whole, whole process. So while we think quick starts are really important to helping people get running, they aren't really what people use when they're doing an operational cluster. It, it ends up being an anti-pattern. Quick starts are designed to get you moving, but then they hide operational complexity as a consequence. Upgrades expose operational complexity. There's just no two ways about it. So, so you have an infrastructure. You have to be able to get it running quickly. But then when we actually get into operating it, we have to see all this stuff that we chose to ignore as quick starts. Um, and it's just, just the fact of life. We need both things but we don't want to run into a situation where somebody assumes that because I was able to set up Kubernetes on my laptop in 10 minutes, that I could then turn around and use that exact same operational practice on day two. That said, we're really doing a lot in Kubernetes to make sure that the, the, all the pieces and parts are there and not that complex to, to move forward. We do the same thing with RackN. We really work hard so that your operational infrastructure is fast and easy to learn and then you can bootstrap quickly through something that actually does day two operations. It's hard not because of Kubernetes. It's hard because we have a lot of pieces and parts that have to interlock. So when you set everything up, it's all in a known state. You wait a couple of days, in some cases a couple of hours, and you'll find that different pieces under your infrastructure have moved. Operating systems have changed, have been patched, Docker has changed. Your monitoring infrastructure is different. You might have a Kubernetes patch. Um, you know, the infrastructure itself, a server might have gone down. You have to bring up a new server. Um, there might be a, a global security vulnerability that you need to quickly roll through your environment. Um, all of these things are pretty normal, and, and they really are an important thing to consider in, in how you build your infrastructure. So um, what that means is we have a lot of moving parts. The best thing we can do is keep them into small units. So they should be composable so we can change ones in and out. All right, enough boilerplate, that's, that's the background. It, it's really important when we think about upgrades in day two operations to, to see the longer term. So as we learn how to, how to use a system, we really wanna make sure we're learning it in a way that is robust, reliable, and, and to me, composable so that you can break out small changes. 
So we've identified four different uh, provisioning patterns. Uh, they are all pretty reasonable. Um, I'll demonstrate the first two, and I, I, if I can, I'll get to the third um, or the fourth. And I have graphics. I have graphics for all of them. So the simplest one that we have right now is this parallel in place upgrade process. Um, a parallel in place just means that I take all of my versions in one and I move it to the other. Uh, and I'll jump over to live demo from that perspective and give you a little bit of background. Um, if I can, oh, I have to get out of this, sorry. So over here, what I've done is I've, I've got, this is what Digital Rebar's UX looks like. Um, and I've got a couple of, of Kubernetes deployments uh, already set up and staged. So in this case, I've built a four node Kubernetes deployment. Uh, on this system, it should be right here. So this is the API for that server. I can jump over and look at the UI for that system. It's a little bit prettier. Um, if you're like a lot of people, this isn't a view you see very much. The more common view for you is going to be this one. Um, and I have those. Um, I have a command line for this also. So 153, I have both of them uh, wired. So let me make sure I get the right. Here's 153. So if you look, I'm running kube control on my local system. Uh, this is a, a quick generated, uh, it's an unsecured TLS. So we're going to skip the TLS. We are still using HTTPS, but we didn't, we didn't get the trusted certificate. This is my server's IP address, so it's just the site I was showing you. I'm just going to ask it to get nodes. It is authenticated. And the system is going to do exactly what you would expect. It's going to go get the nodes, but in, critically for the demo, it's also going to tell me the version of those nodes. And in this case, I might decide I just need to do a quick version change. It should be non-destructive. Um, or there's an emergency patch, I really need to go deal with the security vulnerability. So in that case, what I would want to do is, uh, what we've done is we've, Digital Rebar is wrapping the community Ansible. Uh, what used to be called Cargo is now known again as Kube Spray. Uh, and this builds the inventory file and applies it to the nodes. And what I can do here is I can find my Kubernetes version. I can change that version over here to 162. When I drive my update for this and commit the change in that deployment, it's going to then rerun those nodes with that change. So this is, is a fast and, a, and, and a satisfactory upgrade if you don't mind some downtime. Because what it's effectively doing right now is it's taking the whole system down I didn't tell Kubernetes I was taking it down. I didn't do anything except rerun my Kubernetes deploy script. Um, and it's great if you have a very small change or if you have um, an emergency situation where you're willing to take down time, where it could be this is you have a 2 a.m. maintenance window and you're going to do this. It's very important to me that uh, people get used to rehearsing upgrades. I would never recommend doing this type of thing without having a rehearsal environment, part of what we believe very strongly is that you want to have the pattern of rehearsal. So you, you're always going to go through and practice, repeat your deployment three times, upgrade it incrementally, make sure it works every time, uh, work out the bugs, um, and ideally be able to share those changes back because you're using shared infrastructure. Right? All of the, two, the deployments that I'm showing you here, this is, this is just the Kube Spray Ansible playbooks. So if I make a change to improve this, it's going to go back into the community and everybody is going to have a benefit. Um, there are other ways to install uh, Kubernetes in this. But that's you know, A lot of these would work. There'd be a lot of different patterns. These patterns should hold true. So it's going to go through and I'll check back on it in a minute. Uh, option two is going to be doing a sequence in place. So this is a more traditional deployment model in which I actually can say, you know what, I want to change some of my nodes, but not all of them, into the new version so I could stage it. So in this case, I would change all the workers to a new version, and then I would change um, my, my control nodes one at a time through a process. Um, and the way that would look in practice is using something that we call profile. So in this case, 
I've already created a profile called Upgrade Me with the Kubernetes version. I could create a new profile. Um, say I had to change, I had a patch for Docker, and I could add, I could change the Kubernetes, the Docker version for Kubernetes. So um, let's see, Docker version. And so right now it's latest, so I could pick a different version for that, for that, and then let it go through the process. I'll show you what that looks like. I'm not going to add it. I'm just going to use my upgrade me. But in this case, what I have going is an incremental demo, is this incremental deployment where I can come into one of my nodes. And hold on, before I jump in and, sh and do a whole bunch of nodes work, let me show you this other demo. This is this is the that second deployment. And over here, this is the other this other deployment. So root. So I have my other deployment right here. It's on this new version. And uh, we are all set with that. Um, but what I want to do is I don't want to just tear the system apart. Kubernetes actually has a mechanism for handling this type of graceful take one node out of the infrastructure change. And I want to do exactly that. So here, I, I went in, I got my nodes. And if you want to de duplicate this, uh, rebar.digital, has videos and scripts and all sorts of things. You can easily replicate this demo and practice it on your own and, and play with it. Um, it's all, all open source stuff. But the idea here is I want to take one of one of my nodes and let's see, I'll pick, so here's my nodes list. So I'm going to take this node. Let's see, so here's its name. I'm going to copy that. I'm going to get that specific node. And so what I can do is I can take that, I can take that node and I can make it unschedulable. Right. And so from that, for that process, it's pretty straightforward. All I have to do is say, I want a coordinate. And that net node is now cordoned, which means it's not going to get new tasks and scheduled. Ideally, I would also drain it so that I could remove all the workload. I track when it was when there was no other workload on it. Then I'd coordinate, right? Coordinate and then drain it. Um, I'm I'm not going to take quite that much time in this demo, but this is easily scriptable. The reason why I'm showing you this from this perspective is you could uh, easily write a process that goes through and takes the actions I'm taking on the digital rebar side. I got to find the same node. So we are talking about node uh, 47, there's 47. So I can easily take uh, this process, uh, Rebar has an API also, or any system you're going to use, you should be able to take these changes. Um, I can edit the node, change it to the upgrade me profile. And when I do that, now when I press, now when I go into the worker node and rerun that, that task, it's going to pull in not the deployment level change like I'd made before, but it will actually pull in the change just for that profile. So I can incrementally add nodes into that profile and they're going to go through the upgrade process. So I pause for a second here and jump back to, uh, to my other deployment. There's 153. So this is a little bit confusing in that um, I have Two, I have two deployments running in parallel. The 153 deployment here is already all the nodes are at 162. So the fast way to get that change made, um, it's like server downtime windows, something like that. The other cluster that I have running, uh, let's see, this one, 72 cluster, it's not, it's not, you'll, what we'll see is this 47, we're actually saying scheduling is disabled on this. So this is my cordon taking effect. 
And in the background, it's running the process to do that upgrade. When that process is complete, um, you can detect that or schedule an event off of it. It'll change the status of this event, and that will then be able to trigger um, uncoordinating the node, which we're going to do in just a minute as part of the demo. So back to the, the processes. The other ways that, that people do demos, uh, and all these are equally valid depending on your circumstance and what you're trying to do, is to just do it and what we would call an immutable round robin. And you can do immutability without something like uh, CoreOS or Linux, uh, Container Linux or uh, Atomic or any of the uh, immutable operating systems. All you really need to be able to do is bring up new nodes with the new system and remove old nodes with the old system. Um, and so it's just a rotational process. Uh, this is actually very similar to a process of expanding and contracting your cluster. Um, a good practice in this, and we, we see this with uh, uh, utilities like Bosch, you're in a constant state. As you need capacity, you bring up the latest nodes, and then you're always cycling through the system. Um, as an operational process, this is a little bit hair-raising for a lot of people because you're, you're actually always changing nodes. There's always systems being rebooted and re-imaged. Uh, however, it's also the way to keep very consistent. So if a change needs to be added, you know that change is going to go through the process within a certain amount of time, whatever your round robin cycle time is. Uh, so that's, that's is the add and remove. It works really well in cloud. Uh, if you're in a physical infrastructure, you don't have machines that you can just add and then destroy forever. Um, if, so you're much more in this fourth pattern where what you're really doing is you're taking a system you're tearing it down, you're re-imaging it, and then you're redeploying it. So in that case, what happens is um, I have to have a certain excess capacity to take offline while I'm going through this process. Once again, a very good thing to always be doing in the background is to just have your systems in a constant reboot state. Uh, sorry, not, not meaning that they're rebooting all the time, meaning that you've taken your, your systems and said every week, every two weeks, every month, every system should be re-imaged and rebooted and then you calculate the amount of capacity. So you need, you know, basically, if it's a 10-day cycle, you need 10% uh, of your servers every day are going to go down, which would mean that uh, about 2% per hour are going to be offline, or you could, you could focus it on, on low bandwidth times. Once again, this is a very powerful tool uh, to do upgrades because it means you're in a constant state of upgrading the system, uh, and it means that you don't have to do patching. So, when you look at the processes that I'm showing, the first two involve actually reconfiguring a system and patching it. There are some people uh, listening to this who are probably thinking, I don't like that. It's risky, it's dangerous. The third and fourth approach really start with a brand new system every time. So you don't patch and fix, you destroy and create new. Uh, and that pattern's very effective, it's very clean, it's very repeatable, uh, and we're seeing a lot of people moving into this type of immutable redeployment. It just means that you have the risk of systems coming in and out. Uh, I'm going to jump back in and just check on. Do you hear me? Just a moment and unchat. Hello? You hear me? I don't hear you anymore. Rob? There we go. You, okay. Now you should be. Can you hear me again? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. It, it's 
somebody muted. I didn't. I, either I clicked mute by accident, or somebody muted me by accident. Okay. Sorry for that. I stopped talking once I heard that. That's fine. Um, I was just about to check in. So what I was saying is that uh, both of these are valid. They just depend on your operational process. And I was going to check in on on this deployment to see how we're doing. So in this case, what I've got now, as you can clearly see, I've got that one node upgraded, and I can just simply uncoordinate. So now that system is going to be able to go in and take and take workloads. So I've now done a partial upgrade. Uh, obviously, the system has to be able to handle that um, as part of its as part of its infrastructure. So it's open. It's showing me there's a new version. Um, pretty, you know, this is this is pretty basic stuff, but it's absolutely essential if you're going to run an operational Kubernetes um, cluster or, or a cluster of any type. The the fallback from these patterns. Um, and this makes me very sad when I see it, is uh, what we call lily pad migration. So a lily pad migration is when you say, I can't figure out how to upgrade in place, so what I have to do is I have to stand up a new version of the infrastructure and then move the workload to it. Um, and this is really good if you, if you can't take down that first workload or you can't take any risk, the first uh, platform, and I can't take any risk on it, you just bring up a new one and then you gradually move people to it. Uh, the challenge is it's going to mean that you're maintaining two different workloads with two different versions and it's very disruptive to users. So if we can avoid this, um, a lot of OpenStack deployments I saw ended up with this because the upgrade process for OpenStack uh, never got codified in the community as clearly as it needed to be. Um, this is early days. It's gotten a lot better. Um, as, as with cluster sig ops, we're really trying to help make sure that we don't get into this pattern. Um, but at some point, this is a valid pattern um, for people to move workloads when they can't take a risk on, on transitioning an infrastructure or the change is too big. Um, an example would be in 1.7, we changed the API for the uh, third party resources. If you have people who are dependent on that um, and you want to make sure it's deprecated, then you, you don't. You know, you set up a new cluster with the new APIs. Uh, there's other ways to handle those situations. Uh, so, so this is this is the demos. So I won't. I can take some time if we want to see it and do adding a new re, adding a new uh, resource, a new node into the uh, cluster uh, using digital rebar. That's sort of a fun thing. I actually have the same demo as a, as a recorded demo that just does this. So you're welcome to take a look at our video libraries and check out this process where I'll go through that, that fourth demo. Um, but the whole thing here is that we want to plan, rehearse, and share. So a demo that just one company gets working on just their infrastructure using just their automation isn't really helping everybody, right? There's nothing um, really proprietary in, in upgrades of an open platform like this. We, we want to be able to have that be a community benefit because that helps the platform grow. And I can say that about any platform, uh, but those are things where the more we can work together and share these these processes, the stronger the community is going to be, and the more our ecosystem is going to grow. And that brings me to questions. Uh, I am Rob Hirschfeld. I'm Zico Online. Uh, project I'm showing is Rebar Digital. Uh, my company's name is Rack N. R C K N. So thank you very much, Rob. One question for you regarding the presentations. Sure. Or can can we upload that to uh, or put it on GitHub or on our site? The presentation itself is is available uh, with Rebar Day Two as a Bitly link. Fine. So could... one question from my side. So. For providing trainings, uh, would it be possible to have Digital Reba use it somewhere on the cloud to provide trainings? For instance, the upgrade process. It totally would be, um, and actually, the the infrastructure that the, the my backup infrastructure, which I'll I'll show you. I just have to uh, grab a copy of it. Uh, 
so the the infrastructure usually when I when I build these infrastructures um, they're actually built as a classroom oops sorry and so um, Right, because it, it, the, it's very it's very interesting in this case, right? Rebar is able to deploy. I have three parallel Kubernetes deployments. In this case, I've actually built two student uh, deployments. So I have cluster one and cluster two, and they're actually taking advantage of uh, Rebar's multi-tenancy capabilities. And if I was to log in as a student with cluster one access, I would only see cluster one. Uh, and a student with cluster two access would only see cluster two, and the teacher would be able to see all of them. Um, so this is a this is a single line script that builds a classroom style cluster. Um, super handy for um, doing this type of. I want to show you six different ways to do Kubernetes and then tear it all down um, at the end. So totally. Okay. And we have actually I have some training videos showing how to do exactly that um, in the library. Great, thank you very much. Okay. Any questions uh, from you folk in, in, in the chat? No more questions, okay. Good. If then, you have uh, some, feel free to tweet me. Uh, I'm on Twitter <laughs> all the time. Yeah, thank you very much again, Rob. Um, I will switch to you, Das. Oh, how are you Okay, so you should okay. have the control now. That looks perfect. Hey, ah, fine. Do you hear me, Jess? Unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I know. I hear oh, you. fantastic. So, okay. first of all, the GoTo webinar crashed. So, ah. I went back in and then I was muted and I couldn't unmute myself. So, I'm um, sorry about that. Um, okay, so I will get started. So, um, well, first of all, just to say that it's very early on in our journey to provide this training. So we've really only just started to kind of scratch the surface of um, the, the landscape of the training that we're going to provide. So to, to help us kind of work through it, because as you can imagine, that, that there is uh, an awful lot of different areas um, that we want to focus on to provide a comprehensive view of the um, capabilities and the things that you can do with Kubernetes and its related cloud native technologies. So to help us um, try and to break that down, we've created a number of resources such as what you can see at the moment on screen is um, a mind map, which is the kind of overall mind map um, for the Kubernetes, Kubernetes rather I should say, training offerings. So, um, so we, we've really got four levels, which um, goes back to the diagram that Arash showed earlier. And um, where we start basically is at the novice level, where we provide basic training. But what, what we've identified in um, looking around is that there's a lot of very, very high quality, very good basic training that's already available for free. So there's really um, no point trying to redo that, I would say. I, I think what we're going to focus on is, um, as you know, Kubernetes moves very fast, so some of the training might be out of date. Um, so, and there'll be various levels of quality as well. So what we're going to focus on with the basic training is we're going to look at what's available already in the community, and we're going to look at vetting that. Uh, and we're going to um, look at vetting that for three attributes, which is, um, as we can see over here, we've got 
to make sure that first of all that the training is current, so it's not talking about things that are no longer relevant, and that it is of high quality, so that it delivers the message in a way that is easy to consume, and that it's relevant. So you know there's going to be a number of training resources, and we want to make sure that in combination, collectively they provide a very comprehensive introduction to Kubernetes. So that's our basic training. And then we move on to the proficient side once you've got the basic under your belt. And some learners may just jump straight to proficient. They may not need to go through any of the basic training levels. So when we get to proficient, we kind of like start to focus a bit more on the, the two kind of main consumers of the Kubernetes and related technology capabilities. And th those would be the developers and the operators. So, you know, with the developers, we start to look a bit more about how a developer is going to use Kubernetes to develop applications. And for the operators, we look at how an operator would deliver a PaaS to the developers to make them productive in delivering their applications. So uh, once you've got those two levels under your belt, then we move on to the expert level, which is really, we're not actually providing any courses as such there. What we're going to do is we're going to um, provide some information um, and support so that uh, a learner can work towards the certified Kubernetes administrator exam, which is provided by the CNCF. So we're, we're going to support them in going and taking that exam and passing it. And then um, finally, we have a look at the master level. And this is where we look at some of the advanced domain specific trainings. So here you can see that there's a number up there already. There's something like 20, I think. Um, and there's no doubt going to be more. But we're focusing here on the use of Kubernetes and the cloud native technology stack and related technologies to deliver specific domain solutions. So, you know, how you would use or how you would do CI CD um, with Kubernetes, and, uh, how you would use it to host microservices. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk recently with Istio and prior to that, LinkedIn about service meshes, how you would use service meshes with your microservices or even other applications, other application topologies to deliver those things that a service mesh gives you. Um, you know, how you would use storage uh, for stateful sets, security, etc. So, so basically there, there, there's a whole bunch of domain specific training that we'll be looking to deliver. And then that would take you on to the, the next um, certification which would be the Certified Kubernetes I.O. Practitioner. And with that, what you would do, the learner would nominate from five or so of the advanced domain-specific trainings to be tested on. And should they pass those, then they'll, they'll get the CKP, the Certified Kubernetes I.O. Practitioner um, certification. So, so that, that's kind of like the overview of the landscape for the Kubernetes training. And um, what we've done is we've created some books in Git, which we've published with Git Book, to give more detail about this training and how we'll deliver it and the paths that you can take. So if we have a look here at this training path diagram, what we'll see is pretty much what I just discussed, which is that we, we have a novice level to begin with and then you move on to proficient. Once you, you, you've moved past proficient, you, you could do the expert and the master levels in parallel. And you know that with the expert level, then we would help you to get your CKA, your Certified Kubernetes Administrator exam. And with the master, like I described, you would work on domain-specific training um, and then you could take the CKP exam, but prior to taking the CKP, you would have to have passed the CKA exam. 
Um, so that's basically the, the, the path that you know we, we intend to work through. Although this is very early days, we're just working through at the moment, and we, we definitely are very interested in the community feedback to really shape the, the training path to what best provides the most value to the community. So um, if we have a look in a bit more depth, um, I've already described with novice that we'll look at the, the resources that are currently already available because there's so many high quality resources and we'll just vet them for certain qualities um, and you know provide um, a path to consume those um, resources so that they make sense and take you through the journey of becoming um, a bit more adept at Kubernetes. So, and then as I described before with Proficient, we kind of look, look at the roles a bit more about developers and operators. With Expert, we provide that help in getting prepared to take the certification. And then finally in Master, as I described, there, there's going to be a whole bunch of domain specific things that you can learn and that you would then nominate to be tested on five of them and then you would get your CKP um, certification. So with the advanced domain specific training, um, we're going to use um, solutions from Open Data Center, which is an open source project, um, and we're going to expand those solutions so that we have solutions that basically um, work with the specific domain to allow you to learn about that domain and play around with representative of the real technology to learn how it works in combination, how to stand it up, how to configure it, how to debug it, um, how to architect it. So th there's a few solutions already with Open Data Center, but up to this point it wasn't really um, a platform targeted for delivering the um, training for the advanced domain specific um, training. So that's going to change somewhat. Uh, there's a few solutions there already. Um, so to actually create this training, we've also created another document um, or another GitHub repo and there from there a document, another Git book. Um, which is the Kubernetes train design. And it's really about community. It's all about eliciting feedback from the community about what it is that they want to know, what makes sense for them. And we, we really hope that the community can help us in defining these training courses and working on the content to ensure that the courses are comprehensive and they meet the community's needs. So the, the idea is, and it's very early days, so we really don't have a lot of this to demonstrate at the moment, but the idea is, is that within this um, training repo, which I'll show now in um, GitHub, we'll have design documents for all of the courses. And we'll use GitHub issues to discuss for a given course, what is the kind of content that we want to have in there and how will we deliver that content. And as we evolve that in the issues, we'll update the design documents so that they're visible for everybody and published into this Kubernetes training design book. So, um, okay, so basically, um, there's a few things we've created already. There's going to be many more things, but to make it easy to understand the landscape of things that the Kubernetes are offering, um, I've created this mind map, which, um, you know, th these are all publicly visible mind maps, the ones that I've shown. So from the Kubernetes IO, you can go straight to the website. Um, the training book will take you obviously to that training book I showed earlier. And we have the repos, um, the training design book. We also have a, a YouTube channel, which is where we'll be publishing a lot of our training, um, our, our labs, tutorials. 
Uh, we'll have some more in-depth training on there, and we'll have like little bite-sized snippets of information that can be consumed quickly for you know um, wanting to know something, an answer to something very rapidly. Um, so that basically shows our overall training resources at this point. But as I said earlier, we really are looking for the community to help us with this, and nothing is set in stone. We, we want to get a lot of feedback, and hopefully with the community support, we'll be able to build a set of resources that are free for everyone to use, to take them on the journey of learning all about Kubernetes and the cloud native technologies, so that they can become an expert at this new set of technologies. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's pretty much what I have to show at the moment. Uh, very early days, very exciting, and uh, look forward to speaking to you guys a lot more. So thank you very much. So, Avash, was I coming through okay? Okay, do you hear me again? I do indeed. Did um, that? Did the sound come out okay in the end? Yeah, yeah, I we hear you. Thank you very much um, for the presentation and the whole work in the last weeks, uh, supporting us and doing so nice diagrams and the whole starting the Git book and so on. Um, good. We are coming to the end of our first meetup. Uh, we get for the poll at the beginning some uh, results I'm going to share with you and discuss it a little bit. Do you see the poll results? Quick poll results. I do see them. Do you see that? The quick poll results? Yeah, uh, I can see it, yeah. Okay, good. So um, we asked what you'd like to. Uh, as you can see, the most attendees would like to have to learn advanced Kubernetes techniques. Um, okay, half of them. We had 100 attendees, near to 100 attendees, and at the moment we have some 34. The rest has left. But okay, uh, it shows that. Um, yeah, one third, 67 percent, they want to become a certified Kubernetes administrator. It's nice to know that, and uh, hopefully to be of help uh, on this way for you and help you. And uh, also very interesting, 27 uh, percent, they want to provide trainings. Very happy if you please come. Uh, to, uh, in to get in touch with us. We'd love to provide training together with you, uh, with individuals and companies as well. Um, and 37 percent they want to provide trainings and present their solutions, um, like our friends uh, at Katakoda, uh, they provide um, the platform for uh, our trainings and also uh, uh, pro they want to present their solutions or uh, other companies like um, uh, B42 and so on. Um, and not to, f to forget, uh, small companies like uh, SAP uh, are going also to support us uh, and provide trainings together with us. Um, and we are very pleased, um, excited about that. Um, if there is no questions anymore, I would like to thank you again um, to help us and um, by our First, we have, we have been somehow nervous <laughs> uh, for our first beta, but I think uh, the part of some technical uh, problems, uh, we had a good meet up together. Any other points from you, Rob, Des, Ihor, everybody else is 
because if someone would raise its hand, I can unmute you. I and unfortunately it was not able. I was not able to unmute you all at the, the uh, same time. Um, it um, was not possible. I have to see how we, how we can change that by our next meetup. Good. Um, thank you very much. Great. Great. Very Thank, good you Thank you for organizing. Yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And, um, I think somebody else is making the presentation, hearing what they have to say. <laughs> okay. Good. Then um, have a nice morning, Des. It's very early in, in, in Melbourne. <laughs> uh, try to sleep a little bit. Uh, and have a nice day in the US, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. I still hear you. Oh, I'm still on the phone, that's why.